So, uh, welcome to Reloved Guitars Workshop. Um, and I'm going to put a strange thing on the bench. And it is... Yeah, another Ace Pro. And I don't need a strap on it just now, but... <coughs> yeah, look at this. Ace Pro Telecaster style. A um, bit filthy, um, light as a feather, picked up in the week from Leatherhead actually, bought on eBay on a, on a, what's the word, hunch, yeah, something like that, anyway. Um, uh, the first two, or the other two Ace Pros that I've had, I've been amazed by them, they've been incredible guitars actually, something about them, um, can't quite put my finger on it, but they've been brilliant. So. On the strength of those, uh, I bought this thing, and it's, like I say, it's dirty and not very well looked after. But and it came with the Union Jack vinyl all over it, which I took off straight away. So we've got a basic Telecaster style guitar, three-way switch, um, springy buttons which don't feel very substantially attached, which need looking at. Uh, six individual saddles. Um, the neck and familiar neck and bridge uh, pickups there. Slightly not rusty exactly, but good condition frets or good uh, unworn unworn frets, but old and mucky, needing cleaning. Uh, reasonably good condition nut. The world's horriblest usual cheap nasty tuners, which will go in the bin, um, and the Ace Pro uh, underwhelming Ace Pro logo which doesn't really shout much about how good these things are but so you, I picked this guitar up and I was amazed by the, the lightness of it so it feels like it's made out of balsa wood which doesn't at first kind of glance you think oh god that's awful it's, a, it's an encore or something you know and um, we tend to I, I often equate quality with solidity which isn't the case um, but having brought this guitar home Having wound down the action, I found that it actually plays. Yeah, it's not brilliant in tune because strings are all, but found that it actually plays with the action wound down without too much buzzing. So it was set way too high, but it can actually play pretty nicely without doing any major work to it. Um, and then I strapped it on and then played it a bit, and then I started to listen to the tones coming out of it, and I thought, oh, this is going to surprise me again. I'm going to be happy with this one. So <clears throat> it is a an underdog of underdogs and off come the strings. This, I won't get this necessarily finished uh, today or it may take a while but I'm just going to get this on the go because I'm, I've got a feeling that I'm going to keep this one. Uh, which is a bit silly because I should be I should be doing some more guitars. Well, in fact, I will be doing some more tonight. But guitars that I really must get on and do that I need to sell. Um, but yeah, I'm going to cut these strings. They've been on for rather a long time. The lady in the ad said um, new strings, but they're anything but. They're a bit rusty. So off they come. And, uh, yeah, the, the two guitars, two Ace Pro guitars I had before. One was the. Um, Overbent. One was the SG, which uh, I loved, and eventually sold to uh, Hugh because partly because I already had one SG and I couldn't really didn't play it, and I couldn't really justify having another one. So no matter how cool it was, and he tried it out and loved it. And so he's a gigging musician, so it was great that he went to that kind of uh, home. And then the other one I bought was the uh, Explorer style, um, which was also a great, unusually good guitar uh, for what it, what it cost and what I sold it for, actually, which was pretty low, relatively not much money. Anyway, um, so on the strength of that, the Ace Pro Telecaster, which, again, I think I'm going to enjoy playing as a, an oddity um, gigging type of guitar. Odd because on one level you think no this this is horrible um, it's light it's flimsy but actually it's got a great sound and I think the neck's pretty good 
um, and I think this is going to grow on me, especially when it's all cleaned up. Uh, and I did think the tone was pretty nice earlier on. So I'm going to one. need a container for bits. It's pretty filthy. I'm going to take everything off. Uh, but also these horrible tuners which are going to come off right away. I threw, I threw about 200 of these away this morning. They went in the garbage. Um, got some uh, Wilkinson's coming <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to replace these, which is nice. They'll be and they're split post ones as well, so they will be dependable. Um, so the mild blemish on this guitar is that there are two small fine cracks down in the neck pockets, um, which I'm going to have a look at gluing with my ultra runny CA glue, kind of low low viscosity super glue, industrial strength stuff. Come along. There you go. And why isn't this one wanting to come out? That's because it's got some string wrapped around it still. Okay. Delay. Yeah, Ace Pro. I'm still on the lookout for another one because so far it's all been pretty good stuff. The the SG I had, um, it was the same sort of experience. The minute I got it, one part of me immediately said, God, this is rubbish. It had a neck like a baseball bat. and. Uh, it was just not like all the other SGs, that, uh, or the copies anyway, the phones and the vintages. And for a moment I thought I'd got a duffer. Um, but after a little while, like when I first got it back, in fact it was before I even set it up, I, I got the pickups playing because they weren't, they weren't connected. I uh, got them playing and suddenly I liked the raw sound from the pickups, I was very impressed. <laughs> in the bin with them <coughs> yeah so mighty impressed with them and uh, from that point onwards it just sort of got better and better until right up to the point where uh, by the time I kind of finished doing it up it was just superb and now as I say it's gone to Hugh who's uh, no doubt not before too long will be gigging with it out in the world So I'm sorry about the noise there. Okay. All very straightforward. No, no shim that I can see. Thin little plate. Yeah, no shims, nothing, just a very clean little pocket. Um, nothing, again, nothing I can immediately see about cracks. I can just try and lever it open a little bit and see if anything moves. Um, it probably does just a fraction. That's why I was, no matter how much people say it's not to do with the wood. Um, I'm not convinced. I'm always pretty certain that there's some relationship between the crack in the lacquer and the underlying wood. It's, it's, uh, it's just too much to kind of argue that it's just um, confined to the lacquer. I don't, I don't start from that perspective. So I'm just using a bit of naphtha to get a quick uh, clean down. Really just to remove any huge any build up of grease but <clears throat> I don't think this guitar has been used that much really to build up too much um, finger goo so really this would be about 
dusting it down. I've got to get those grunt, um, grunts, uh, ferrules out as well um, in order to replace. Actually, they may come think of it, the vintage, the, what do you call them? Wilkinson tuners may well just go straight in on top of those, but it would be good to um, take them out because the new one's probably slightly better quality. Um, just take the string tree out as well. I'm going to hang the neck up out, safely out of the way. Um, bearing in mind, it doesn't want to hang very well. So maybe I won't hang it out of the way for now. Maybe I'll just put it next to that one. I'll find somewhere to put it afterwards. I just want to give all of this clean. Uh, and again, I'll put it just off to one side for the time being because I'm not going to be taking the electrics to bits just now. I just want to get the sort of major bits off uh, so I can give it a good clean. So out will come all the British saddles and they're fairly straightforward um, to intonate. These just this is a simple little two-legged saddle so no problem at all. When it comes back it comes time to uh, re-intonate just I mean, uh, one, one thing you can do if you're unsure is just take a, a quick snapshot of the position they're in um, and you'll know where to begin or where roughly where to start from um, if you can actually make it take a photograph thank you yeah you'll know where uh, broadly speaking where to start from um, when you come to do it again They're quite long. Uh, I'm going to put them together in case the springs are any different lengths, but they are quite long, so they make a, a fair. It takes quite a while to unscrew them and get them off. Um, I'm trying to get that to go back in. It doesn't seem to want to come along. The, these little uh, barrel y things, they have a, a, a groove down one side, and it needs to sort of go back together that way. So if you want to make it easy for yourself and you want to make sure that the same components go back in the same place, uh, you can take them off and, and sort of put them back in roughly the right order or in the right configuration as before. Chances are they'll, they'll all be the same, but I'm, I'm just going to give myself a sort of head start by keeping them in pairs, uh, sorry, in, 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 together. Yeah, sorry, I can see that some of these are clearly shorter than others, so um, they don't, haven't wasted space so if I just uh, kind of put them back like this then I, I'm pretty <coughs> clear to begin with where they go um, and in this case they're, they're going in very much in a, a straight line all the way back What it means is the second group, the base, the base saddles, if you like, are um, they're all got slightly shorter bits than the others. So in this case, I'm going to make them follow just a single, simple linear curve. But in fact, when we put them back on, they won't do that. They'll go in two little runs of three. I'm in the mood to just take things apart at the moment, so I'll get this and the Anturia um, Rockstar um, apart, and then it'll sort of push me to do at least complete one of them this weekend, along with everything else. Okay, we're nearly there, that's probably recognisable. Yeah. 
I'll switch this over. Right, so I can see that all pretty much um, easy to line up when we come around to it next time. So just um, having a look at all the bits. There, nothing was faulty. Um, I don't really need to get underneath and or look at the wiring on the pickup or anything like that. It was working fine. So I'm just going to take it as red that it's in good nick. I just want to clean the chrome a little bit, but that's about all. I'm using the wrong cloth because that's already pretty mucky. So yeah, just cosmetic cleanup. Um, I will want to take this off because it's it's a bit loose. Um, so I'll have a look at that in a minute. And this is a, it's got that sort of slightly translucent, translucent, translucent um, finish to it and that you get with some of the, well, you often get with the Fender Telecaster. So it's, well, it, does, it feels like balsa wood. It does have sort of an interestingly marbly sort of look to it. I wouldn't say it's beautiful. It's, it's kind of more curiosity value. Somebody would look at it and go, "What's that?" And they would have probably said that even more when it had the Union Jack stuff on it. But um, probably would have been accused of being a racist and something or a National Front member and, and in a fight of some sort. So that probably could do with a bit more cleaning up. Um, it's not, I've got rid of all the grunge on the chrome. But again, it's just the start for now. I just wanted to see it, how it shines up a bit. Uh, very simple jack plug. Uh, simple but effective and it, a lot less hassle than, um, for example, the one currently on uh, Pete's custom build um, because it's surface mounted and it just it's easier to uh, tighten up, easier to do things with. So why not? Um, yeah, all around, not bad condition. This couple of little things. Um, so if I just get I know volumes right down, but if I just go underneath uh, and look at the electrics and see what's making the Oh, that's the wrong thing to do. It's uh, see what's making the pot the pot spin. Sorry, the so that's that's threaded. That it's worn out, so we need a bigger one than that. Um, ooh, it's got a sort of. That's very simple. Right, so we what have we got? A bit of a spinny. We got a spinny pot. A bit wobbly. So it could use, and this has had some masking tape put on it before when it, it's been put back in. So the switch has been loose before, so I need to watch out for that. Okay, when do these come off easily? I think they do. <laughs> that makes them a bit easier to tighten up. Then Working with just brute force. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I can see where that's just moving around. I'll tighten it up. Let's have a look. Uh, judging by, I don't quite know where it's meant to be pointing at this point of time, but. I'm going to try and make it line up with the other one, just as a start. I'll get a pair of pliers on it. Oh, typically I'm going to cut my hand again. Some liability out here. I have to get myself some special Darwin Awards insurance. So can't find the pliers I want. So to that end, I may use an adjust, small adjustable spanner. Blood. I don't want to spill that. I don't want to spill that blood anywhere. 
So really I'm just going to manually tighten this up. There's not much else I can do. I can't really get, there's no solid anchor point at the back. It's sort of not accessible really. I'll just put a bit more tightness on here. And that'll, that'll hold for a while longer. Just check this. Yeah. Somebody's uh, somebody has sort of beefed up these screws in the past um, to make sure they stick and chances are well, there's a chance that they'll fall through if I don't do a similar thing. It's just a quick look. Will it or won't it? Actually it's no, it's not too bad. It will be alright. We'll need to do something with this one because it's worn through. Yeah. Stripped its thread or whatever you call it. Again, um, since I don't intend to be doing anything much to the wiring in here, we could drop a little bit of um, instant nails into that or get a little toothpick and put some instant nails into there. And that will just grip it a little bit more. One of those challenging things is like almost impossible to get something like this into a hole where there's no air vent at the bottom. Think about it, how the hell do you do it? Um, let's check, see if we've got these slightly larger screws than that. I've got some new ones here. In fact, they are a tiny bit bigger. Oops. This is actually, uh, it's one of the things I quite like about Wilkinson. Is it Wilkinson? No, it's actually, it's not Wilkinson, it's Vanson. Uh, yeah, eBay seller Vanson, Ben at Vanson, I think it is. And um, I noticed that the, last time I bought these things off him, I noticed the, the replacement screws, the new pickguard screws were slightly larger than the old ones and it just seemed that that was a deliberate decision knowing that by the time you came to replace them you were doing so because the previous ones were probably starting to waggle loose um, so the one thing you would need is a slightly oversized uh, screw which I just think was a really smart idea so I'm just going to put that under a bit of pressure and it bite down in. That's, that's good. And push these knobs back on. In pretty clean condition anyway. So off to one side. Not much else to do about this. Um, these seem to really don't really matter where they go. They're just there are no markers or anything. So they just do what they want. There you go. Bits more solid than they were before. So, uh, I may add some super glue into the cracks here, but it's, it's minuscule. Don't think I'll get very far. Uh, what we can do is put a lever in here and just gently lever it backwards if it works and hardly so it's so it's a smaller amount of movement it's not worth it's not worth doing it sometimes you get more of a more movement and then uh, you can literally prise it apart a little bit and then close it and then close around the glue. But this is this is almost spot. Uh, it's, it's very stiff, doesn't go anywhere. So I'm just going to drop a bit of super glue into this corner and if it penetrates into, into that crack anyway, that's good. If it doesn't, it's no worse than it was before. That'd be good. Another lid that doesn't want to come off. Okay, one down there. Oh no, 
the time it's gone just at the end now. That's not what we need. I wondered how long it would take before this pot got gooed up. Oh, that's lucky that's coming through good. Okay, so sunk some into there and a bit more right at the end, but if it's going to go, it's going to go. If not, it'll just soak into the wood and do what it has to do. It's a tiny bit to do at the end here as well. So it's, it's at the, um, as always, it's the mechanical corners, the weakest part of the structure. Um, when you hit a, a 90 degree angle or close to 90 degree angle, it's just um, structurally that's guaranteed to be a problem. So, a bit of glue in there. If it's going to do any good, it's going to do it now. If not, that's about it. Great stuff that CA, um, but mighty expensive. I'm going to throw these old pickguard screws away because I've got some new ones and I don't need to keep all of them. Um, right, and I'll uh, put this back. So, in terms of the Ace Pro, I've got the neck that I want to um, put new tuners on. I'm going to, blimey, that is, uh, oh dear. A bit bent backwards, so I'm gonna um, gonna go counterclockwise and take bend out of this. I'll take the hmm, it's a bit spinny. There doesn't seem to be much. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, just about. No, maybe. I think we could be in one of those cases where it's got a straight. A straight or concave down this edge <coughs> and uh, convex down that edge. <sighs> Can't win. I'm going to leave it at that. There's no more accommodation we can do, so I'm going to have to just do it as a compromise between the two. Okay. So for now, um, what I could do with this one now is uh, mask this off and hang it ready to. Um, to do the fret levelling and polishing and all that stuff which I now need to get onto with the other one so I'm going to jump around a bit from one thing to another <coughs> um, hang this up so see in a bit okay so I'm on, uh, on setting up the Ace Pro neck for uh, fret levelling treatment. Um, at the moment the neck is, wow, it's con vex on the, <laughs> oh what a lovely piece of twist that is. That is definitely a warped neck, my friends. So this is going to be a personal player, I'm afraid. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the sort of seller never told me that. Yikes. Now, this kind of gives me gives me rise to I don't know if you can see down here. Let's see if you can I can line this up. Uh, see any of that twist in there? I can't see what you're seeing, but um, it it twists. I guess this end twists clockwise. Uh, <clears throat> It'll play, um, but it's not going to be perfect. So this is a this is a let's not spend too much on this guitar because it's probably not going to get sold. Um, but I do still want to ensure that it's got the best playing frets possible. So I'm going to go whizzing into the fret leveling game now. Just uh, going back to that, it's convex and concave, and actually I'm going to go on the slightly concave edge, this edge, and it'll be sort of as near the middle as I can get it right now. So it's a bit 
cheap and cheerful, but we know that it's got some good pickups on it, and uh, we know that it's light and it's probably going to be quite fun to play live or in the band situation. So I think I'm looking at uh, a fun kind of underdog guitar, uh, which is absolutely fine by me. That's what Real Love Guitars uh, is about in some ways. So this is a not for sale num number. So it partly sh I should. I'm kind of thinking I should be getting stuck into the rest of that uh, Antoria semi-acoustic. Um, yeah, that's quite a long job, that one, because I've got to refret it. I won't say hugely long, but um, so I've got to do that in bits and bobs. Uh, so, get our masking tape cutting platform up. And I'll just, uh, I guess I'm doing this partly for my own edification. <coughs> um, I could, since I'm not going to sell this, I suppose, technically I could stop this here and not record anymore, but uh, it'd be a shame in a way, because Ace Pro is a really interesting brand and I wouldn't think it'd be a waste or a shame to just chuck this bit of information in the bin. So I'll carry on. I just may not, might not Talk as much all the way through it. Mm -hmm. Where in the hell has my knife gone? I've got a special one there. Well, warped or not, I'm gonna give it the treatment. And I have a secret theory that warped or not, this is going to play well. <coughs> so, I, I don't mind about its condition. I think, I think it will also surprise me um, how, how little difference it will make, actually, that's what I'm thinking. I'm not very good these days at making these lines follow straight, straight edge of the ruler. I'd be wandering a bit. So things are changing down here in Devon. Um, in a month's time, I'm going to be. Uh, leaving my salaried job um, in London and I'm going to be doing a combination of going back there at an associate, uh, or as an associate, day rate basis um, and a combination of that and more Reloved Guitars stuff um, which means uh, making Reloved Guitars into a, a proper business um, which I'm in the process of finding out what the right way to do that is um, and doing a bit of both, which I think I'm really looking forward to having some maybe better balance than uh, I've currently done so far. It was like doing two jobs full on. Um, oops, sorry. Also, I'm hoping that uh, this way of doing it from here on in will it be uh, just allow me to take take up the challenge of. Uh, turning Real Love Guitars into whatever, or developing it into whatever it has potential to be. So um, I think when you're pursuing a, another main, uh, main full-time job, sometimes it's hard to <coughs> develop something fully. But um, so that's what I may need to do. And with a bit of luck, what do I have to do to make this work? Right. Yeah, with a bit of luck. Uh, I think I'll just enjoy the balance of the two things. Um, but it's very exciting too to think about how to do um, more different things with Real Love Guitars because at the moment I've got a few ideas but I've got nothing set. And that's far from being uh, scary or daunting actually, it's really exciting because it could be anything. I just intend to 
carry on developing it the way I've done it so far. Um, and yeah, looking forward to it. I'm also hoping that every month I might just have a bit more free, free time, uh, play a bit more music as well as um, do guitar things, play, play some more music and um, hopefully learn a bit more as well. Because I don't have a lot of time for learning other than weekly band rehearsals, which is increasingly good fun and challenging. Especially when you've got your first gig coming up in a month's time. Which is amazing because a year ago I wouldn't have even thought about it. Um, in a way it was only, not only, but, but doing Real Love Guitars really spurred me on because uh, having a few guitars around the house and then having an opportunity to buy a half decent amp, which I hadn't had an amp of my own, or decent amp, sized amp, for many years. So just coming across that took away uh, step by step some of the barriers to playing music with other people. Um, and then meeting more and more people and eventually came to a point where Malcolm, um, who, whose guitar I was doing, mentioned that he was in a band. And uh, I sort of jokingly said, oh, if they need another rhythm guitarist, let me know. And he came back and said, well, yeah, Richard, why don't you come down? Which I did, and I'm very pleased I did as well. So, it's been a busy, busy year in all kinds of ways. Right. Getting there. So you can see the process of doing this is just being quite diligent, isn't it? Right? Methodical, something like that. Getting all these bits cut to size in advance and then just being able to pull them well, pull them off the board and stick them. Um, and I know that I saw in some catalogue some blue special tape, especially for luthiers, um, it came in three different thicknesses, but to be honest it was quite expensive, relatively expensive. Um, but of course, it saves you all that trouble. But I quite like this part of the process. You don't have to think too much and just to kind of do something repetitive and satisfying as you fill in all the gaps. You talk about rubbish along the way. So the funny part about doing any of this was um, I guess for many years one in one form or other I've done some podcasting it's been something I've always worked oh shit always worked with uh, sound um, I was never did anything in radio but as soon as the technology of podcasting showed itself on the scene I was sort of doing it um, and I've done a few I tended to do a make a podcast about whatever I was doing at the time so it's uh, just to give you an example it's gone from podcasting about uh, business to um, podcasting about driving taxis which I did for a while and podcasting about uh, gliding which I did for a while too and in a way video YouTube uh, this is a form of podcast as well so something I've always liked doing um, but the thing that's always amazed me about it, <coughs> completely incredible, I've always found, is that um, you, you're, when you podcast or do a YouTube or whatever, um, the, the fact that somebody gets to listen uh, on their car journey or whatever, or wherever, whatever they're doing, it's amazing to be, to think that other people are, um, listening to what you do, what you're talking about. And it's very, it's a very personal sort of medium. I really like it for that. Um, and it always kind of tickles me when somebody says that they, uh, they, um, they're sitting at work in, uh, somewhere in the USA <coughs> and um, listening to me write it on whilst doing guitars. I think that's quite just, just 
<laughs> blows me away. Um, right, so what am I looking for? Pencil. So on this Ace Pro, I'm just going to do the fret level check with the fret rocker. Um, and where we hear it clicking, uh, it tells you you've got uneven frets or high or low frets. It's, you can't tell whether it's high or low. Uh, and in a way, it doesn't really matter because this fret level check is kind of relative. Um, and the, the fret level approach I'm going to use will kind of run, will level ever, everything without really bothering to ask which is high and which is low. The only important point to kind of keep in mind is that a low fret in one spot will make an, an adjacent fret appear high or register it as high according to this um, fret rocker. So, and then you often get corresponding things like this. And if you can see there, that one appears high, it makes a clicking noise, and the, the ends of that are high and that appears low. So I would go, guess that that's probably low, which makes that appear high, if you see what I mean. But I can promise you if you, if you get into the situation where you start to think about it, you can very quickly think about it too much uh, and you go completely mad trying to work out which is actually high and which is actually low. So long as you level everything with a beam or a fret levelling file and you do it all together at the same time, you just don't need to know, you don't need to try and work out which are high and which are low. You'll see them show up very quickly. Um, the high ones uh, flatten off very quickly and seem to be losing more metal than uh, all the other frets put together um, and the low ones will stay untouched by the, uh, the file for quite some time and you, basically the challenge with that is that the high ones are the easy ones you can take those down quite quickly it's the low ones uh, you're kind of obliged to take all of the rest of the frets down to meet the low spots um, and that can seem really destructive taking lots of metal off uh, because you've got a fret here that's been hammered in way too flat um, yeah it has to be a judgment call at the end of the day and there may be situations where you if, if it's so badly hammered in and it's so substantially low rather than take you know a year of life off all of these frets by taking them all down to meet the, the this uh, problematic one you may have to consider taking um, replacing that problematic one so here for example here is a this is an incredibly high fret the scale of that rocking there is enormous but again it's following that pattern where it's hugely high at this end which, which I'm indicating by heavy marker um, but it's got that gap in the middle but this showing high and it's there's two examples three examples of that and it's just you, you find it corresponds when you've done 100 of these like I have. Um, again, high spot in the middle. And we'll probably find low high spots at the ends. Yep, both ends and nothing in the middle. So, repeating patterns. Actually, what, what was the problem will show when we actually uh, take it down with the fret leveler. So this really, at uh, this stage, the, the, the wise amongst you will have realised that if I'm going to level it all with a single beam or a fret levelling file, you might think, why the hell am I even doing this, since it's going to do the levelling without, without needing to refer to my markings or observation. There's no actual need for me to be doing this. Well, you could probably guess that it's out of sheer nosiness and interest. Um, I think we may have a contender for our Vern's 100% uh, neck here. Let's see. Now, I think this fret here has saved him. There's one fret that has saved this. Two frets have saved this from being up there. 
Uh, so we have 2, <coughs> 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 21 frets. We can only access 19, out of which 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, sorry, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 out of 19. Uh, and let's just cheat and call it 17 out of 20. So it's 85, call it roughly 85%. So on a par with the, um, with the one I just did, this one here, the very pretty uh, leather caster neck. Well, that was 80% uneven, but this one is a little bit more uh, substantially uneven. So anyway, so here's the here's the game. Take your marker pen and go over the top of every single fret. Problems on it or not, every fret gets covered. Um, and that then allows us to check where the file is doing its cutting or the sanding sandpaper is doing its sanding. Um, and it will very quickly re reveal the nature of high spots and the, nature, the location of low spots. Um, again, if you were doing this, and you were going to use a fret leveling file or a beam, you wouldn't need to mark all this up. You just get fire on in there. Sorry, you'd need to mark it up. You wouldn't need to check for level. You just mark up frets and start scraping away. Um, now, on this Ace Pro, I can't remember ever reading what the uh, what the radius was supposed to be on here. So I'm going to have a quick look around with my new gauges. It's not 7.25. I don't think it's 12. Uh, don't think it's 14. Um, I don't think it's 10. Is it 9.5? Hmm. It's showing me here it's flatter than 9.5. It's telling me, is it really 12? Should it be 12? Do you know what? I think it is 12. That's a weird thing, isn't it? A Telecaster with a 12 inch radius. Is it 12 all the way? Don't tell me they want to put some compound radius on this. That would not make my day. No, it's 12, it's not 10, not a 9.5, no, it's flatter than that, it's a 12, that's amazing. Well, is it amazing? It's a 12. Congratulations, it's a 12. <coughs> right, which means uh, I've got some options. Icon. So for modeling these frets, I can either use a 12 inch radius block which will enforce the um, 12 inch radius onto this, whether it's 12 inches or not. And you quickly know whether it is or not, because if I go down here and it's, this isn't 12 inch radius, you'll see either the ends or the middle only getting um, scraped. And if you carry on with it, you'll make it 12 inches, whether it was or not. Um, now in this case, I'm gonna happily just go along with the 12 inches, but it's also Remembering it has a slight twist in it, which I'm just going to have to follow it like a roller coaster. So I'm going to take the volume down a minute, and uh, I'm just going to get stuck straight into it. I'm doing a 12-inch radius block. So here we go. Oh, blimey, I can feel that twist. <laughs> in fact, what I might do because of that, I might support it in here. And again. Um, Prop up the end with a, a pen. I'll just take, there you go, I'll just take any stretch out of it. Okay, ready, here we go. Yeah, that's the right radius, that's good. Um, on target. So, first thing you can see is as soon as it's hitting, uh, taking metal away, it's um, it's taking metal away usually on the spots that you've marked up as the high spots, 
and it's taking away as much as it needs to to get them all down to a level. Um, you just need to keep going until such times as you've got all of the frets just slightly bitten by the uh, part of the, the block or the sandpaper I should say and, um, and once you've got there then you can stop and just do another basic simple check for uh, level mess so you make sure that any of the clicking sounds that you had before have cleared up and gone away so it's looking quite good uh, I've, I can tell you now there's a there's a, a low spot there there's a low spot there low, tiny low spot there one there one there one there that's quite interesting but the rest of it is, is seems to be all right so I'll just turn it around prop it again this end and just look it a little bit at this end downwards but not too much pressure just uh, repetitions and as soon as we made contact with taking the black marker pen off the, fire, uh, the fret then we'll, we'll stop and measure uh, to see if we've got any unevenness still remaining got those low spots not being hit yet. <coughs> get there. Nearly there. It starts to get dusty. Oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. Brush the dust off it. Okay, while I'm at here I'm going to just check for levelness again. Still slightly bits of unlevel, so there's more to do. Um, put my book in my other ear while I'm doing this. Levelness. It's quite um, quite extreme. On, well, extreme. It's taken quite a lot off one or two frets, but that's just a measure of how uneven they were. Okay, so mostly is level, and even in some of the spots where uh, we thought it was going to be, or it, it was most uneven, that's gone. So that that. Yeah, uh, dent there is causing a rocking there but we st the only way we're going to get that out is to still carry on come down to its level so keep on doing it but again that's just due to these two two spots um, that's really amazing <laughs> See, I like to get this exactly right because I want this to play the best it can um, you've got to go to, um, to, to get to those dents 
I still really haven't got those ironed out. That's mad. See what it is is that the mm, the frets are the frets that were they're put in at 12 inch but not pushed all the way in but crimped in at the edges most of them were left then sticking up like that and then it, these two have been pressed in at that central point only and so they kind of go like almost like an M shape those two frets uh, which is kind of creates a bit of a pain in the ass problem for us because it just means you have to take every, everything down to meet these imperfections which means we're kind of aging the frets now quite massively right, I'm going to stop there just check that one last spot tiny little bit unevenness courtesy of that low spot and that's it I can't I don't want to take any more out of these frets just chasing that one little dent. So next stage in this is to paint over the frets again and we're going to get ready with the fret crowning file which is going to take these flat spots or these flat frets and going to round them off turn them back into the the right sort of profile more like a an arch shape or a dome shape or whatever. Um, it does show me that the the technique that was used to put these particular frets in was all over the place. They're not consistently done. Right, so what I do is I'm going to use, uh, what are these, jumbo frets? Probably. I'm going to use the jumbo side of this thing. Let's just check on one of these, first of all. Yeah, it looks pretty good, actually. So I'm going to turn the volume down. I oh, no, can't go much further. Um, I'm going to reprofile each of these frets one by one and just basically letting the diamond uh, coating of this do the cutting. It'll take a fair while because I'm taking quite a lot off the fret. But it will get there and then we'll move on to the next one. And once we've done all of those, uh, then it'll be his sandpaper and polish will come back to me when it's time to do that. So let me switch off now to save you all this boredom. And I'll see you back when all that's done. There you go. Right, so all of these uh, reprofiled. Um, not the easiest thing in the world given how uneven some of these things were. And again, uh, the low spots which really skew the whole thing. Um, but it's pretty much now flat, as flat as it's going to ever be. So I'm now going to begin the polishing process. Um, and that's going to require some uh, two or three sheets of 600 DPI, uh, 600 grit paper, followed by the um, a set of micro mesh papers until it's all shiny, and then we'll be done. So uh, I'm going to turn the volume right down again because it'll just uh, blow your ears out. So we're going to start the old sandpapering by hand.
12 inch radius, I'm still thinking on this. Interesting. Right. I'm going to do one more with paper. Uh, uh, foam thingy. Lock. going to go to the micromesh sequence and just race on through that. Spend a bit more time at the beginning on the 1500 because it's a big jump but once we've through that one it's fairly brisk. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Right. Right. Okay, up with the volume. Okay, welcome back to the Volanda volume. Um, so, this is the frets all shined up and levelled um, on this bizarre twisted neck of ours. Weirdy, weirdy. So, we just have to accept it's not going to be perfect. Uh, I don't have any clever techniques for re-warping the neck, although I, I do believe I've seen people do it in the YouTube land of learning, aka YouTube. Um, it involves clamping and sometimes water and steam and I don't know, maybe not. The clamping for sure. Um, so, I mean, you never know, a bit of brute force could uh, possibly get this back into its original shape, but I can't imagine it would uh, stay. You, know, you could iron it into place. I don't know. Though. As I said, I suspect it would probably be quite fun to play anyway, even if it's not 100% precise because of that warpage. Um, but like all defects on guitars, it's, it's kind of interesting just to have it. I don't. I think it's worthwhile having it just to see, have the experience of um, being able to test what that difference is. And if it's no appreciable difference, then you know you don't have to spend so much time worrying about it. If guitars have such defects. Okay, I'm just going to go over it now with the. Naptha. Time is currently blimey half ten already. Okay. Now I'm going to knock out these ferrules as well in a minute, I think. Um, and I'm going to wonder if out loud if there's a jig of some kind I could make to try and bend this back into square, true, as I say. Um, but I have no idea whether it's doable at all. Yeah, I mean, Christ, you can really see. <laughs> oh, lordy, that's that's when you can see it. When you look at the uh, the flat, the flat of the heel versus the twist of the flat of the headstock, it's significantly... And in fact, that's even bizarre. No, that's right, so that put that flat and this is twisted this way. Yep. Yes, as we expected. I think if we were to um if we were to try and adjust this, we would literally be having to twist both of them a certain amount uh, and leave it for who knows how long. Um, might be worth doing. I'm sure we could make a jig that clamps both these both these bits in their respective planes and then we could literally bend them up into the right right place. Um, hmm. Let me just think I'm gonna pop out these ferrules while I think so I'm gonna need a bit of a bit of foam. block of some sort. I need a... that'll do. Sorry if it's noisy again. There we go. Yeah, why not? Why don't we give it a, a test bend? Instead of rushing to put it back together again. Hmm. What do we reckon? Is it worth it? Okay, all of those out. I'll stick them in the pot anyway. Which is over 
Yeah. No, that's the Antoria. Okay, I'm using track now. Ace Pro over here. Yeah, so what I'd have to do is I'd literally get these two parts and bend them. Wow, something else. Just twist them opposite each other. How would we do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I don't know right now. I think that's a bit more trouble than this Ace Pro is worth. The question I've got is having done the fret work on them, um, we won't do any harm to string it and play it, uh, which I can't do tonight because I've got new tuners, but there'd be no no harm in getting it ready to, to um, string and play. So I'm just going to hang it up and move on. Um, and I'll do a bit of research in the meantime. But I'm, I'm sure it's going to play all right, just as it is, but you never know because it is definitely warped. Um, okay, look, so uh, now let's clear up some things because I'm going to switch this off and switch over to Antorio mode. Da, 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 da. Oh no, we're going to go back to the other one. See you in a minute.